Leslie Weir became the Librarian and Archivist of Canada on August the 30th, 2019. She is the first woman to be appointed to the position since the National Library of Canada and the National Archives of Canada merged to form Library and Archives Canada in 2004. Prior to her appointment, Ms. Weir was University Librarian at the University of Ottawa from 2003 to 2018, she also held positions at the National Library of Canada and the Statistics Canada Library. She was born and raised in Montreal, earned a Bachelor of Arts in Canadian History from Concordia, and a Master's in Library Science from McGill University in 1979. I think I met one of your profs the other day, ah, Peter... Cool. McNally. Yeah. For sure, yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be chatting with you today. What is the mandate of Library and Archives Canada? Well, Library and Archives Canada plays the role of both the National Library and the National Archives. So we're responsible for acquiring and preserving the published heritage of Canada, and we act as the memory of the federal government of Canada. Okay, and how's that going? Because it was somewhat controversial at the time when, when it merged. Yeah, I think the merger was somewhat controversial, but now 15 years later, I think we've grown into ourselves somewhat. Okay. And that we have recognized that both professions of librarianship and of being an archivist are both valid. They're mm -hmm. very similar. They have lots of overlaps. And they have lots, lots of unique aspects as well. So unique. As long as you recognize those. Exactly. Then, yeah. And we can take the best of both of the professions right. to create a, a very robust organization. Plus, it, uh, I guess it saves some money, too. That might have been, even though they, they at the time they said that wasn't the reason, it might have been one of them. I think, I think at the time, the Master Sheila Copps felt that some of the backroom, the, the sort of corporate services yeah. made sense, you know, to be to be amalgamated. Okay. And that I think there was an assumption there would still be specific programs around libraries and around archives. Okay. Yeah. So if you m amalgamated those two big organizations, why didn't you include the Library of Parliament in that? Ah, interesting. Um, the Library of Parliament is definitely part of Parliament and, and of the Hill. And as such, it's part of a different arm of government. I could have seen a question about why we didn't amalgamate what was then the National Library of Science, mm. which was the Canada Institute of Science and Technology, SISTI. Yeah, but that's um, still out there on its own? It's still part of the National Research Council. In fact, all sorts of different government departments had their own libraries, didn't yes. they? Yes, yes. And, and they just sort of closed them down, and apparently there was a concern about loss of memory. A number of federal libraries did disappear during the financial downturn in sort of 2010, 11, 12. Mm. Mm. Um, I will say we have some very robust libraries that are still with us at Agriculture Canada. Yeah. My alma mater, Statistics Canada, okay. still a great library there. Uh, actually, agriculture is where archives started out, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, so our original collections uh, came from the Agriculture Library. Yeah. That's but, right. But they're still, they're still active, I guess. They're still active. And yeah. in fact, some of our collections, uh, in terms of the National Library, came from the Library of Parliament. Right, so, right. You know, we all collaborate. We work together. Well, I mean, the, 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 as I understand it, the Library of Parliament tried to scoop the stuff that the original Brimner is his name, the guy that was doing the work originally as, a, as sort of the first, quote, archivist, and then he resisted. Do you know, this reminds me of the situation in the United States. Because mm -hmm. there's the Library of Congress. Which there, basically serves that role as, as the, li the Library of Parliament, right? Parliament, exactly. Yeah. And they are sort of the de facto national library because there never was a national library. Yeah. But the Smithsonian felt that it should actually play the role of okay. the national library. Right. And so there were, um, there were leaders that mm. uh, had interests 
Empires. In, in, uh, in, in uh, looking at the options for the country. Right. But I think we've settled quite well now with Libraries and Archives Canada. We work in very close collaboration with the Library of Parliament. Yeah. And we also um, uh, work qu closely with many of the federal libraries as well. As I say, if, if I was uh, whoever was doing the cutting, I imagine it was Harper, then I would have just said, get them all together. As I say, why didn't they just go and bring them all together? Well, actually, our merger of libraries and archives, that That's was actually right. under the Liberal government. That was a large government-wide cut, I think, affected not only libraries, it affected many departments. Right, okay. But uh, I'm glad I'm here now, in 2020, because we've got some pretty exciting things coming up at Libraries and Archives Canada. Yes, good. Well, I do want to. I do want to hear about those, but I. But I also just want to sort of cover the mandate. Do you think that you are getting adequate funds to fulfill your mandate? Well, I think funding is always a question um, for every library, for every mm. archives, and actually for government departments. I will say that we've got some really good tools that help us to be able to build our collections. Mm. Because of course we have legal deposit, and so we yeah. do get two copies of publications published in Canada, and we do acquire one copy of foreign Canadiana, mm. i.e. you decide to publish a book and your publisher is actually in France or in yeah. the UK. Um, That's current though. I'm, I'm, what about acquisition of important, nationally significant works of literature or history or science or whatever it might happen to be? As I understand it, there hasn't been a lot of acquisition going on in the past 25 years. It has been mainly through, through gift and donation with some small acquisition. One of the challenges is that our law, Libraries and Archives uh, legislation, yeah. And in fact, the National Library and National Archives laws before that really focus on our role as the National Library for legal deposit and on the government record. And when we look at private archives or private library collections that might highlight parts of Canadian culture and history, it's something that we, that we, we are interested in, but it's something that doesn't derive directly from our act. Oh. So I've been criticizing the library for something that it hasn't really got a mandate to, to do, is that it? I think in our legislation it's, it's identified as something that's desirable for us to be able to do. But it's not something that you have to do. Correct. Correct. That's we lousy legislation, well, we isn't work, it? We work in partnerships with other organizations. We do have a newly created foundation, the Libraries and Archives Canada Foundation, which uh, was launched last April, and they are looking at doing fundraising to really support us in our acquisitions. Yeah, it's about, it's about time. And looking at the possibilities in terms of historical collections, in terms of literary collections, well, that's you know, good to in know. terms of, of broad areas of interest. And I, in fact, I was just at a meeting of the of the board over lunch today, okay. um, chaired by Jacques Shore and vice chaired by uh, Roseanne Runty. Uh, and who are these people? Um, so Jacques Shore is a senior partner at Gowlings here okay. in Ottawa, and Roseanne Runty is the president of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, okay. which is a funder for research in academic institutions or research infrastructure in so, academic institutions. So we have a we have a number of Canadians who are really interested in working with Libraries and Archives Canada at arm's length so that they can actually do fundraising to support some of these developments and collections for us. So, in other words, you are going to have significantly more money available to acquire what? Well, that's the question. We are always interested, for instance, in the archives of, of Canadian uh, literary figures you're interested, but you haven't been able to spend the money on them. You can give them tax breaks. We can give them but tax you can't, you, it doesn't seem like you've got any money to, and it's, I mean, this happened with Michael and Dodge, not that, about yes, a year. Yes, that's an interesting case because we do have the, I think, the first four phone of Michael and yeah. and we were unable to require, acquire the most recent one that went to a university in, in Texas. Yeah, Henry Ransom. Um, we do have about 300, we have archives for about 300 well-known Canadian authors through period of time. 
both uh, in terms of uh, French-speaking authors, mm -hmm. English authors, and indigenous authors as well. But it, you, you must admit that over the last 25, 50 years, it's been, and I'm just realizing this, it hasn't been your mandate, and you maybe haven't, you just haven't had the money, even if you wish you had, to be able to acquire. Is that, well, is that accurate? Yeah, I, I wouldn't go back to 25 years. I'd say certainly in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, Mm. Because previous to that, before the last large round of budget cuts, we actually did have an acquisition budget, mm -hmm. but it was one of the things that uh, that was cut when we were undergoing a budgetary downturn. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, the budget was, in 1990, was $110 million a year. Is that right about what it is now? It's about $100 million now. So that's not exactly keeping up with inflation, is it? It's not your fault, it's the politician's fault. Well, there are many competing priorities, and I guess politicians need to look at what they feel will bring the best value to Canadians. And there's no votes in giving money to the library. We have some politicians who've actually been very, very supportive uh, of the library. We have a number of senators and a number of current politicians and ministers, and I think it's very interesting to look at some upcoming initiatives we have in terms of building projects where, for instance, Catherine McKenna has really stepped up and has been a huge supporter of our joint uh, building project with the Ottawa Public Library. Oh, yes. Um, we also get great support from our new Minister of Heritage, uh, Stéphane Guibault. What does that mean exactly, great support? Well, he came to the, to the reveal of our new building and he's very, very excited with the possibilities of us being able to engage with Canadians. And being an environmentalist, he's really thrilled that we're looking at both of our buildings being zero net carbon buildings. So um, he's excited and he showed up. Well, and he's, you know, <laughs> been in the position since November. Yes, and yes, And he's yes. learning about his portfolio. Yes, yeah. Um, but okay. in, in talking to portfolio heads, of which I'm a group one of that, so that includes Catherine Tate from the CBC, it includes the heads of our large museums, it includes the uh, head of the CRTC. Yeah. So all, all organizations working in the cultural area, I think he is quite excited about being involved with Canadian culture, mm -hmm. and with looking at ways that he can support us to, to realize our mandates. So, yeah. Well, I think it's funny because when you did launch the uh, foundation, it, it wasn't a really big bang, it was just, it was a news release and that was about it. I, I couldn't find much more. I mean, uh, I think it's very exciting news yes. and it's, it's, it could have a big impact on, on the organization, it, depending on if the banks open up their tight little wallets. Well, the launch of the foundation may have been slightly overshadowed by the fact that we were also announcing uh, jointly with the foundation, the first Libraries and Archives Canada Scholars. Oh, right. So we named uh, a, a group of Canadians who use archives, use libraries, um, writers, historians, and the foundation launch was at the same event. And oh, okay. we're actually going to be um, naming our second group of LAC Scholars on the 22nd of April. Okay. Coming up this year. Okay. So that's, that's, that's quite exciting. And I will say for the 22nd of April, the website for the foundation will be live. Oh, good. Okay. So and that way people can actually go there and give them money. That's right. And actually, you can come to the LAC website right now. And, and if you click on the donate button or give to LAC, yeah. you can either link directly to our archivists and our librarians to talk about a gift in kind where you might give us books or archival material. Mm -hmm. Or you can click on donate money and it actually takes you through to the to actually give money through to the foundation. It's extraordinary that it's taken this long to set one up. The foundation? Yeah. Is it or, uh, or I not? I think it was the brainchild of my predecessor, Gilbert Young, and he asked the same question. I think he thought, why doesn't the LAC have a foundation? Yeah. Uh, you know, the National Dog. Gallery has a foundation, yeah. the museums have foundations, and uh, so he, he really moved on, on setting that up. And, okay. um, It'd be nice if you had a museum store here too. Like I like museums. Well, stores. in our new building, at yeah, but that's five, six five, years Albert, away. That's six years away. I hear you. We will have a store in that. In the but new not building. here. 
not here. Okay. Um, here we share this building with another of other, a number of other government uh, departments, and so it's no longer wholly Libraries and Archives Canada space. So it's kind of difficult to be able to create those kind of services in the building. Okay. Another uh, hot button has been the exhibition program. Yes. Uh, I can't remember the last big exhibition celebrating a Canadian literary icon. Uh, I can't, I mean, that's, it's decades. I might be wrong, but, and I, but I do pay some attention. Yes. Well, yes, because our last exhibit was on the Prime Ministers and the Arts. So it was looking at... But not, sorry to interrupt. No, so this but was not a literary... I, I think it's important to have Blockbuster. Yes. The last one we did was Gabriel Roy. Was that a blockbuster? Well, I don't know. I'd say yes, that it was a blockbuster. Okay. Um, now, one of the challenges we have is that this building, while it has an exhibit space that we have used, mm. um, this building has some challenges in terms of the air quality, the humidity, yeah. the temperature. Um, as you well know, I think, and have seen in, in the news over decades, you know, we, yeah. we have had pipes break, we've had leaks in the roof. And so we have quite substantial concerns about putting any original materials and, and exhibiting those here. And so that's why we're so excited. I, I know it's years away, mm -hmm. but we're very excited about the new building because it's mm -hmm. going to have a museum quality exhibit space. Big? Able, big. And we're going to be able to be having an exhibit while we prep for the next exhibit and then be able to swap them over. And we are in collaboration with the Ottawa Public Library. Libraries and Archives Canada gets 80% of the time in the exhibit space. Okay, good. And then we'll collaborate as well with the Ottawa Public Library. Plus you got a bunch of people coming in there every day. That's right, because, it's because a, we're anticipating 1.7 million visits. Mm -hmm. Just like they, they do in, in Montreal with in the Montreal, Quebec. Yeah. exactly. National. And uh, if you look at the new libraries op that opened in Calgary and in Halifax, yeah, yeah. Uh, they have that that level of, of, of daily visitors too. But they, yeah, but the, the, this is sort of an operating municipal library that's the, they're coming in, but they're also you're benefiting from that. Correct, yeah. correct. And yeah. we're really excited about that opportunity. Okay. So right now, we are we loan a lot of materials to other libraries and archives and galleries and museums. Mm -hmm. So that our collections can be visible, we also have partnership partnerships with the Canadian Museum of History mm -hmm. and with the National Gallery. So we do have materials of ours exhibited there. They've got a little library there, don't they? They do. Yeah. They have a library, but mm -hmm. we also have exhibit space. They have a very good library, actually. Mm -hmm. And we're we're in collaboration with the Glenbow Museum in Calgary. And I don't know if you know, we have service points in Halifax, Winnipeg, and Vancouver. And the one in Halifax is with Pier 21, the museum. Service points, meaning you've got a space that you can put the exhibitions in? Or? So we have experts. Yeah. We have the uh, ability to be able to do exhibits. We also have the ability to meet with people visiting who want to learn more about Canada or perhaps learn about genealogy mm -hmm. or learn about more about the Indigenous people. And so um, we have the collaboration with Pier 21 in Halifax. And then we have a collaboration with the Vancouver Public Library in Vancouver. Mm. And we have our own facility in Winnipeg, which actually holds all of the military records of every Canadian veteran going back to the beginning of the country. Where is this again? That's in Winnipeg. Okay. Well, speaking of uh, spread out across the country, authors' papers, important Canadian authors' papers, seem to be spread out all over the place. Alice Munro and, and Mordecai Ritzler out in Calgary, Mavis Gallant, Margaret Atwood in Toronto, mm -hmm. and Irving Layton in Montreal. I mean, we touched on it. These are the most heralded, popular Canadian authors that have, you know, that have written in the last 50 years or so. And then, exactly. I won't say none of them, because maybe you've got some of their papers, but it's just extraordinary. Well, there's a, there's, there's a few things there. Sometimes an author really wants their papers going maybe to their university that they studied at. Maybe yeah. that's where they met their partner. 
Um, you know, they had their yeah. formative years as a writer. Yes. And so sometimes it's really the choice of the author yeah. that they would like their papers to go somewhere for a specific reason. But you didn't have the, if you had a big pile of cash to say, really, it should be in the National Library. We didn't have a pile of cash to necessarily to do that. You know, we've got Robertson Davies, we have Jane Urquhart. We, we have some of Michael Ondaatje's, we have Carol Shields, uh, Thomas King, yeah. uh, George Browning. So we have a number. You do. Um, I like to use, it's, it's actually not a liter literary analogy, but I think it works well. Okay. For instance, the tragically hip. Where should their archives be? It should actually be in Kingston because there's so much part. But they are national icons. So what we need is some method to be able to have collaborations across the country so that Canadians can find those archives. Mm -hmm. They know where they are. Ideally, much of them are digitized. People can access them remotely. They can know who's got which archives. And that's something that we can look at doing by facili you know, facilitating that conversation. Okay. We have a dozen uh, universities that have strategic partnership agreements with us. The first one was the University of Ottawa when I was <laughs> at the University of Ottawa. What year was um, that? That was five years ago, okay. so we're just about to sign a, a renewal mm -hmm. uh, with Jacques Fremont, the, uni the president at the University of Ottawa. Okay. But we do have agreements you know, with the University of Toronto, um, with Dalhousie University, with the University of British Columbia, so many universities, and we're looking at doing more of those collaborations. So what do these collaborations do, or what do they mean? Is it you're going to jointly let people know they're going to put on more exhibitions of these they, uh, were our authors' works, or are you going to they promote? They mean many things. In okay. some cases, it's working with their students and faculty to facilitate access to collections. In some cases, it's doing collaborations on innovative projects, for perhaps something like Digital Humanities, where we worked, Libraries and Archives Canada worked with the University of Ottawa, with the National Arts Centre, to celebrate Shakespeare 400. And sometimes it is doing internships, where you, ex you exchange people, so that our people go to one of the universities and someone from the university comes here and we each learn about what the others are doing. And in other cases, they're where we say, let's collaborate on a project like the one we've just talked about, which could be a potential project where we could look at how you could have some kind of portal that would help you enter and access all of the literary archives in Canada. Mm -hmm. That could be a future endeavor. Okay. So we're looking at many different kinds of collaborations some of them may be LAC with one university. Some of them may be a, a group of universities getting together with LAC where we have a common interest. I've heard that another area of concern is that a lot of your people's time is being dominated by access to information requests. And, and they aren't doing library stuff. They're doing access to information stuff. Access to information is very important. It's important to Canadians. But not at the expense in, of having a, a great library. So this is, this is always the ongoing balancing act that we have to play at Libraries and Archives Canada because we are both the National Library and we are the National Archives. Try, and because you don't have enough money. Well, and we try to ensure that we're looking mm -hmm. at where we put our resources and mm -hmm. just how we balance that out. Access to information, the government is, governments, provincial and federal, are trying to become more and more transparent and more proactive in that. And I, I don't know whether, I mean, Canadians realize that we did digitize all of the Canadian Expeditionary Forces for World War I, uh, 640,000 records. And mm. one of the reasons that we did that was to celebrate the anniversary of, of the end of the war. Um, but another reason was that many people want to know Canadians want to know what their family members did yeah. and what their lives were like and what happened to them during the war. Yeah. And so we would get a lot of requests to access yeah. that information and it's better to digitize it and have it up available for everybody to be able to access. Yeah. Now as we look at the anniversary of World War II, we have a lot more people engaged in the armed forces in World War II. So that will be a, an interesting project ahead of us. And of course, even current veterans, living veterans, veterans who were fighting in Afghanistan come to us to get access to their records. So when you say access to information isn't really primary work of a national library, 
it certainly is of a national library and national archives where you're trying to ensure that veterans can access their records. Well, I guess what I'm talking about is studying your collections and letting people know what's in here and showing it to them. That, right. That's what uh, is missing, it seems to me. Well, it's something that we are, we're working a lot on. In me coming into this position, I have a background in digitization. I have a background in, in, in IT. Mm. Uh, at the same time, I am a treasure lover. Mm. I'm a big reader, and I enjoy print books just as much as I do uh, digital collections. Well, that's good but, to hear. You know, in having a national uh, library, national archives, like Library and Archives Canada, that's located in Ottawa, not all Canadians always can come to Ottawa. So it's very important that we do digitize our collections and mm -hmm. we make them available to people in their communities. One of our challenges is we have about 3% of our collections digitized. And it doesn't increase because we receive so many new analog books and records every year that there, our digitization just keeps us sort of at the 3%. In fact, each year we still get more print, new print materials, than we get digital. Good. And that's increasing every year, and we think it will right through to about 2030. Okay. 2030, we think it'll plateau, but we don't expect it to go down until at least 2050. And we don't expect it to go down radically uh, in any of our lifetimes, because print is still very important. So that means that we really do need to be actively digitizing so that we can be present in people's communities. Yep. And one of the things we're talking about is working more closely with public libraries because many, many communities in Canada have a public library. And that could be a very interesting door into libraries and archives collections and, and services. Mm -hmm. and, so and plus a way to raise your profile among the population, because if, if they don't know you're here, then they're not going to put pressure on the politicians to increase the funding. That's very true. So the what more you, our profile is increased, what are you the planning more people to do are aware. To... Well, I'll tell you, we're, right now what we're doing is we're working on a, on a vision for 2030 for LAC. And we think that if we have a very compelling vision, at the same time that we're building this new facility yeah. at the Ottawa Public Library, and we're building our new uh, preservation center in Gatineau, which we call Gatineau 2. We well, this is over and above the beautiful building that's out there right now. Correct. We're in the okay. middle of building a new building. Okay. It started in August. It's going to open in 2022. Mm -hmm. And we're going to call, well, I call it unofficially, just between you and me, okay. the White Diamond. Because it's a white building, yeah. shaped like a diamond, and it's going to link to our current building. Okay. And it's going to have state-of-the-art robotic uh, vaults that are robotically served up to people. We're going to be keeping our preservation and conservation labs in what will now be Gatineau 1, but the two buildings will be connected and we'll be increasing our, our space to store treasures radically. And it's going to be a net carbon zero building. So it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. So you don't think you need to change your legislation and the act? You're doing, you're, what you're doing is you're sort of getting around that by having a new foundation, is that right? Or it would that, be nice if you could have a change. Is, the Act is 15 years old now and we're certainly um, looking at the Act and reviewing it mm -hmm. um, because questions come up in relation to legal deposit as well. Mm -hmm. As you know, we have legal deposit on um, books and on magazines and uh, on music, of course. I raised the question about things that the newer generations, the younger generations, the millennials might be interested in, in terms of, oh, things like video games, mm -hmm. um, because those are sort of modern depictions of Canadian culture. You know, so it's, it's an area of interest. I do, I talk a lot about us engaging with youth, and, and uh, sometimes people here at LAC laugh because uh, I say, I, I better define youth with you, because for me, youth is anyone under 40. But that's only because those are generations that were born into a digital world. We're kind of a unique group, aren't we, that, that have experienced pre and post. It's, exactly. Uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're like uh, digital immigrants. We, mm. we, we came to digital partway through our lives. Yeah. Um, and we, I guess we, we're, we're more thrilled by it because we've known what it was like not to have it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we really know the power of the internet mm -hmm. because we remember mm -hmm. pre-internet. Yeah. And and I think I think it creates incredible opportunities for us in terms of engaging with Canadians, raising the profile of LAC and raising the profile of Canadian authors and heritage.
I just want to talk quickly about a couple of people. Uh, uh, we mentioned him. There's a statue of him behind uh, behind the 395 uh, Wellington building, Arthur Doherty. He was the Dominion archivist from 1904 to 1935, and he was a collecting maniac, apparently. He just scoured the country, and, and we all benefit as a result of that. Can you give me a little thumbnail on him? I, what I can do is tell you a, a story about something I experienced very recently, mm -hmm. which uh, was amazing for me. We uh, had the uh, commissioner of the Yukon here um, uh, visiting us, and our archivists pulled out a number of materials from the Yukon for her to be able to see, and uh, she is looking at uh, the 125th anniversary of the Yukon hmm. in 2023, and is really interested in looking at possible exhibits they might have. And um, this relates to, to, uh, to Arthur Doherty because she showed us a copy of the very first gold claims that were that were were, were made. Mm. Um, she had a map. We had a map. We have a map of where the claims were and the handwritten names of the people who put the claims in. And then we have copies of the claim documents. And then we have a letter that was written to Arthur Doherty from the, the then um, commissioner in the Yukon mm. saying, these things are of national significance. I'm sending them to you so you can take care of them and make sure future generations of Canadians can mm. see and experience these. Mm. So he, he was pretty good at getting that message out he had because a people knew that. He had a yeah. network and people knew mm. that the Dominion archives were, was looking for all things relevant to Canada and Canadians, and even where you know it it might become can part of Canada later. You yeah. know, we have the relationship with Newfoundland as well, and it's just very interesting to see the kinds of base collections that he developed. Also and he the went after the stuff that most people probably said, "What what the hell is he doing?" Yes, yes. And exactly. now look what we've got. And now look what we've got. Which which leads into my question about. A collecting culture in Canada, a book collecting culture. What are you doing to celebrate that, to motivate it, to encourage it? Because it's really important to it a library. Really and I don't think there's much of a one out there right now. Well, what I would say is that we have extremely great partnerships with the International Writers Festival, with um, the Ottawa Public Library, and we do a lot of book launches. And I know because I go to most of them. I'm talking about collectors, though. Oh, collectors. All right. Well, what I'm trying to do is build a generation of collectors right. so that people experience authors. And we always have independent bookstores at all of those events, mm. selling copies of uh, print copies of the book, trying to develop that interest. But not even, not even necessarily just books. Collectors going after weird stuff that you don't even think is important now, but 20, 50, 100 years from now will be really important. Uh, as I say, I don't see the library reaching out to collectors. I don't mean just everyone going to Writers' Festival. I'm talking about collectors and collecting. Well, I'm in month seven, and I have to say this isn't an area <laughs> I've explored yet. Okay. Uh, as you know, I say each and every day is like running a marathon, but a lot more fun. Yeah. And so this is an area I'm going to look into to find out uh, just what we are doing because I I do know that but that many of our librarians, especially those in relation to rare books, and many of our archivists are mm. part of networks across Canada. Yeah. But I don't really I don't know the details about that. I'd have to I think, I'd have to explore that question. I think if if I may, I think the, the library should get behind. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know where it is right now. A national book collecting contest. There is there was one years ago. I may have. Just run out of funds, but it's. Uh, I, I think I just interviewed uh, uh, Heather O'Donnell, who's a really highly respected young ish woman who has a, an antiquarian book business, Honey, oh. Honey and Wax. They just introduced a collecting prize for young women under 30, and they're getting some fascinating stuff. 
Oh, that's super. So, and she's very passionate. The, the, my, I interviewed her recently. It's up on the site. And she, toward the end, it's, is beautifully eloquent and passionate about this. I highly recommend you have a listen. I will do that. Okay, so that was, uh, are, anything else on Arthur Doherty? Doherty? I meet very regularly with, with team members at Libraries and Archives Canada. Okay. And um, I've done a series of uh, 11 town halls back in December, and we're moving into visioning uh, meetings that we're going to be doing in, in April. Okay. And his name comes up quite regularly. Well, I think when he's a hero. He's about, a national he's a hero. hero. And when we talk about the fundamentals of uh, a, a national archives, mm. um, a lot of what he thought and what he wrote about and what he did mm -hmm. is still felt to be very relevant today. Did he did he write any books or th that I can go and scout out? I don't know that he wrote books, but I think that we hold some archival material of his. Okay, so I can come in and use the uh, facilities then. Uh, correct. I was uh, reading a, a book by Pierre Burton not that long ago about his writing habits. And uh, it's funny because he references the National Library or the he archives. He was a heavy user. He, he was, was a very heavy user of us. Yeah. And what he talked about was the fact that it was open 24 hours a day. So I'm assuming it's not it's not right now. Well, we've got the internet. And we've got your your website's open. That's right. Our website but, is open. But still, that, um, I just was uh, that was like a doctor making a, a house that, call. That was actually back in the days when I worked at the National Library because I worked at the National Library uh, in the '80s okay. and early '90s. Right. Um, and there was a there was a period that it was open 24 hours a day. Oh, oh it wasn't standard procedure from For, zero forever. to no. Yeah, okay. No, okay. No. okay. So I thought, but I think I thought you're that right. was pretty great. The internet great. really did create, especially as we digitize more materials, it created a, it created a, an opportunity to kind of balance the, the in-person visits with the, with the virtual visits. Okay, so we're going to celebrate Arthur Doherty somehow. And Kay Lamb, he, now he came from BC, right? Yes. And I, I don't know too much about him other than, again, he was, apparently he did a really good job of sort of bringing library and archives right into the center of government and made sure the politicians knew how important it was. Yes. So that's, your, course, that's one of your jobs over the next? Yes, it is one of my jobs. Uh, and in fact, that's an area that I have invested a, a a certain amount of time over the last uh, my first six months yeah. is learning about the workings of government, understanding the role of, of, of all of the different uh, departments and their relationship to Libraries and Archives Canada. And I've actually found I found it extremely interesting having come from outside the government. And at the same time, we have a very very strong heritage group that includes the other um, heritage. Organize institutions and organizations, and we work in quite close collaboration with them as well. So yes, profile raiser, that's one of my jobs. Well, and when he did that, the growth of funding from 1950 to 19, well, I'm not sure exactly when he left the scene, but it was really significant. It was really significant. Yeah. Of course, the National Library was founded under under his uh, direction. Yeah, thanks to the uh, Massey Commission. Yes, yeah. And then, of course, we had Dr. Sylvest, followed uh, by Marianne Scott. So the only other woman who's been a uh, leader of either the National Library or the National Archives, um, and like me, a librarian. And in fact, the current chair of the Friends of the Library at Libraries and Archives Canada. And she's... She's a ripe old age. She's, uh, I think, uh, just turned 91. That's fantastic. And still actively engaged. Very Comes good. Comes to all of our book launches. Tell me a bit about that Friends of the Library. What, what's that all about? So the Friends of the Library are a group of people who um, really do care about the library. And uh, they're really interested in, uh, they're also very interested in books specifically. They do a number of different uh, initiatives to do relatively small-scale fundraising 
for Libraries and Archives Canada. They hold book sales uh, and sell uh, used books. Sometimes when we receive gifts of books with the agreement of, of the donor, where the books perhaps don't fall into our area of, of mandate mm. for collecting. Yeah, um, just uh, on that point, is it true that if someone has a phenomenal collection of Winston Churchill, for example, <laughs> that you can't accept you you can't accept it because of your mandate? Well, we're mandated to collect materials by Canadians, about Canadians or uh, that reference Canada in some way, shape, or form. But Would we be the ideal place for the seminal collection on Winston Churchill? Built by a Canadian. Ron Cohen, <laughs> correct. <laughs> I know him well because, of course, he gifted us the Lucy Maud Montgomery yeah, collection, yeah. which is a stellar, gorgeous collection. Yeah. And it's not only the first editions, not only including the book covers, We've got movie memorabilia, we've got posters, we've got artwork. Uh, it's a fabulous collection. That it's, would make for a great blockbuster exhibition. Agreed. It definitely would. But um, Winston Churchill, one of the interesting things, and, and this is something libraries feel quite strongly about, if someone already has, some institution already has a very strong collection, you should make it stronger. Mm. Is there one in Canada that is there another one in Canada that's strong? I believe there's at least one institution that has a good Winston Churchill collection, but the major collections are in the United States and yeah. in, and in the UK. I just think that uh, it's just kind of odd. You look at the National Gallery; they've got tons of European paintings in there. They got they got all you know. They got some of the world's greatest paintings. They got the yes. Voice of Fire. Focusing on Canadian is certainly essential. That's essential. But if you happen to have a, uh, some Canadians who've done some outstanding collecting work and they want to gift it to you or they want to sell it to you, what an opportunity is that now? Is that written into your act? I think we need to change that part of the act. The act doesn't say we can't. <laughs> okay. um, but it does come down to priorities, and, okay. and we wouldn't want to ignore important Canadian collections. No, I'm not saying that. It's essential to get Canadian. Yes. But if you've got this gravy here that a Canadian collector has, I mean, the fact that it's a Canadian collector is important, why not allow Canadians to benefit from that instead of it going offshore? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that we can debate and discuss over time, both at LAC and okay. in the community. Okay, so just uh, winding down here, I was listening to the National Librarian of Ireland. She's, I think she's got her own little podcast, or she did one episode. And she talked about the fact that the, the library um, and archives was what they're like the memory keepers for a nation they're to be you know sharing that memory over generations and the objects they collect tell the story of Ireland just like they would tell a story of, of Canada and she of course ties it to identity and we don't have much of an identity in this country you don't think so well, we've got hockey players and we've got uh, American basketball players and we've got a lot of American TV. Isn't it the role of the, the we, National Library to help foster and, I agree completely. And, I, and, and a strong identity? And working with other partners, and that's one reason why we want to raise the profile of our collections and make them more accessible. Um, we're also in discussions with the CBC because they have quite incredible collections that reflect Canada and Canadians, the diversity, mm -hmm. um, including, like us, so with the Indigenous peoples, with new Canadians. And they've so, got all sorts of literary archives that they could put online, right? Well, and they have, they also have, uh, they're working right now digitizing their archives of the North, mm -hmm. because they've got all of the TV, radio, broadcasting, um, it you know it, it's in indigenous languages. It's, there's all kinds of going back 60 years. Yeah, Here, plus they got all the Peter Zowski uh, TV interview right. shows. So I'd love to watch so those. So we're looking at how we can collaborate with them because currently we do receive their archives like with other government organizations. Right. And at the same time, 
they have some very interesting programming. You know, we don't have an education program to reach out to uh, teachers and, and school kids. No. Uh, we did, but uh, mm -hmm. it hasn't existed for, for more than 10 or 15 years. And they do have a, a program that mm -hmm. they're developing and, and investing in. And the we're plus they get $1.2 billion a year. That's 10 times what you get. Well, but it's a great way, though, to look at bringing uh, content together to cr help totally. create that national identity and the regional and local identities mm. if we can collaborate with partners like the museums and like CBC mm. where we can actually create things that teachers can then bring into the classroom yeah. and yeah. kids can actually experience. I mean, another thing, in our new building, I'm really, really keen for people to be able to access our treasures, but I'm also keen to look at um, whether we can do things with augmented reality where you could actually go and experience a historic moment um, where you could actually be at a battlefield or you could actually be at, you know, Honors of Confederation. Or in a novel. Or you in could... a novel. Exactly. I think we're going to look at creative ways to use technology to be able to create some of those experiences and that we are going to focus on helping Canadians and especially young Canadians to understand and know about and be proud of their country. Well, I'm pretty uh, happy uh, to know that you're the chief librarian. It sounds terrific. Now, if only the rest of the government would listen. Well, we'll work hard to make sure everyone understands just what we bring to Canada. And uh, it's a great job. It's an exciting place to be. And I can't wait to be able to welcome everybody, not only to our current facilities, to 395 Wellington. We also have monthly tours of the Gatineau Preservation Centre that are open to the public. And we're looking forward to our new building, Inspire 555, which is 555 Albert Street, opening in early 2025. 25 or 24? Uh, we're moving in in 24, and we're yeah. having the official opening in 25. Okay. Fantastic. Well, uh... I've, I've been kind of negative on the library and archives over the years, but uh, you've certainly given uh, me reason to feel a lot better about it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've been speaking with Leslie Weir, who is the new seven-month-old librarian and archivist of Canada here in Ottawa, Canada. Thanks again.